Steeplechase racing actually has its roots from fox hunting. Fox hunting was very popular and is very popular over in England and Ireland. Steeplechase racing was actually racing from one steeple to another. And there were two Irish gentlemen fox hunters that were out one morning, maybe it was actually afternoon, and having had a few nips of their whiskey along the way, and they were feeling sort of brash, they said, I'll race you to the next steeple. The steeple was the church, and in fact, back in those days, the tallest buildings in, you know, when I say those days, we're talking uh, over 260 years ago, the tallest buildings then were, of course, the church steeples, and that's how you identified the towns. And that's why church steeples are unique architecture all unto themselves. They said, I'll race you to that church steeple, and it was uh, in Bonavent Church in uh, County Cork, Ireland. And these two gentlemen uh, raced each other for the privilege of having to buy each other a drink at the local pub. And uh, to this day, looking back in the record books, nobody knows who won that race. Uh, but they do know it was a great celebration, and they decided that maybe we should do more of this. If you look at the old spelling of steeplechase racing, it was steeple chase. So it was chasing to a steeple. And today, the, we've merged those words to steeplechase. That's all one word. Steeplechase racing was actually brought over to the United States uh, when the United States was, was in colonies. And in fact, George Washington actually participated. He was a great fox hunter. Uh, he loved the sport. Um, he had a pack of hounds. On top of that, um, he was known to do uh, uh, several point-to-points. And point-to-points were sort of like steeplechase racing. The United States is steeped in steeplechase racing, but today it's totally different. Uh, it's become a social phenomena as much as a sport, but it's a very serious sport. These uh, thoroughbreds are trained year-round to do what they do. There are about 40 steeplechase race meets around the country. Most of them are on the East Coast or a few in the Midwest. There are at any one time probably a thousand steeplechase horses that are in training. And a typical steeplechase horse, uh, if they remain uh, healthy, will probably run anywhere from three to six times a year. If they're really good, like my horse, uh, Break Clean, uh, who sort of got me into the sport, he was, uh, in one year he ran over 10 times, and he had three wins and five seconds and a third and a fifth, I think. So he was a very consistent performer. Steeplechase racing means a lot to a region in that it, it, uh, it's wonderful for open space because you, most of these race meets have been put into protective easements so that they can never be developed, as we've done here at Brooklynwood. It's a great sport. It's a great social event. Most people that come out to the farm, uh, I think they're amazed at the beauty of the farm. Most of them probably don't know the front end to the back end of a horse. Less than 1%, I would say, really know much about a horse at all. And that's okay, because really, if you think about the number of people that really understand and know horses, if that's who we were appealing to, we wouldn't have enough revenue to support the event. And certainly, sponsors uh, would not sponsor an event like this if they were required to understand much about the horse at all. What we've done in the steeplechase piece of it is we're teaching the horse to run and jump. That's a unique combination because a horse typically, uh, m most of them are natural jumpers to some degree. They generally don't jump at speed. You know, they jump you know, like you would see in horse showing where they, everything is a very controlled effort over the fence. In this case, they're going at 30 miles per hour with 10 other horses on either side of you. They have to be taught how to do that because it's very distracting to uh, a horse to have horses on either side of you and then to be able to have to run over an obstacle at the same time. But they learn fast. Most of them are very, very good at it and because, as I said, horses tend to be natural jumpers anyway. So if you can teach them to run and then you can teach them to jump, it's a great combination and then that, that, that starts the steeplechase racing. You know, a lot of the ones that we said, hey, this this is a... This looks like a steeplechase type horse. But what you can't read into a horse is their heart. And it's just like a human being. I mean, how many people do we know have all the ability in the world and 
the smartest people in the world. The, the, they're, there's nothing that they can't do, and yet they never amount to anything. There seems to be a lot of those type of people wandering around in the world, and there seems to be a lot of those type of horses wandering around. And uh, my present horse now is one of those horses. He's got all the ability in the world, but he just doesn't have the heart to just be competitive. And of course, there are different elements of competition. You know, there, there, there's some that uh, you know you get right down to the wire, and you're asking that horse to just dig deep, find me that last ounce of energy that you have to push your nose across the finish line. A really competitive horse sort of instinctively knows where the finish line is. First and foremost, I wanted to start a, a, a steeplechase race in the Charlotte area. Almost all steeplechase races that are held in the United States, unlike in England and Ireland and France and other places, are all done for the benefit of others. Uh, most of these associations, such as the Charlotte Steeplechase Association, is in fact a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is to raise money for other nonprofits. So it seemed uh, as a natural outlet for me that, yes, I liked horse racing. To me, it wasn't about money. It was about putting on a great day of horse racing and trying to raise money for other charities. So an associate of mine at Sonatrol came across this land here in Mineral Springs. I didn't even know where Mineral Springs was. And we ended up buying it in uh, September of 1997. We ended up paying considerably less than what we were prepared to pay for it. In the end, we ended up getting uh, a raw piece of land. It was certainly not this beautiful. When we designed this race course, the goal was to build a state-of-the-art race course. We wanted to build the safest race course that we could for the horses and the jockeys, who were ultimately the athletes of the day. Uh, we wanted to build a race course that would allow the spectator to be able to see um, almost the entire course, if not the entire course, in, in almost any area on the race course. Uh, we really wanted the ability to have people to never say, I went to the Queen's Cup and I didn't see a horse. We never wanted to hear that. When we contoured this, we wanted to be very careful that it didn't look like we spent a lot of time contouring it. We wanted to make, make it very natural looking. As though it was already here, the pond was here, all we did was we just put up fences and we cut out the hill to make the tiers. And I think we've accomplished that. And the return is, is that I get the feeling of knowing that the, the Price family is, is giving back to the community um, every year. Uh, we're helping some wonderful charities. Um, I think, if anything, what a great way to demonstrate not only a beautiful sport, a sport steeped in tradition. Um, in fact, thoroughbred horse race or horse racing is the oldest organized sport in the world. Um, and it's one of the most simplest to understand, you know. <laughs> they start, and whoever has their nose in front at the finish wins, you know. There's not a whole lot of complexity to it. But it is a very, to me, it is the most beautiful sport in the world because it is natural. It, it, uh, horses are doing what they're bred to do. Jockeys are doing what they want to do. Spectators are doing anything that they want to do. And yet you don't have the disturbance of... Uh, humanity sort of in the way. If anything, it's sort of an anti-development, anti... Uh, it's, 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 it's about beauty and open space, almost like a fair, just the way they used to do things 100, 200 years ago. The Catawba Lands Conservancy is in fact now our exclusive charity. We feel very strongly about that. Um, uh, every day, 41 acres disappear permanently to development in the Charlotte area. We donated uh, two, a little over 200 acres of Brooklyn wood to a conservation easement. And we did that primarily because as we look down into the future, into the success and the continued success of the Queen's Cup and its growth, we never wanted that next board of directors to ever be tempted to sell the land for development purposes, for profit. At the end of the day, when it's all said and done, when everything has been developed and all the developers have made their money, and I'm not, believe me, I'm not against that. You know, we're a landowner as well. You know, we, we, we're not a developer. But my company, Sonatrol, takes advantage of new construction, new development, mostly in the commercial industrial segment. So we're not, I'm not against development. What I'm against is the, is the disregard for 
the future, the disregard for open space. Everybody wonders every time there's a rainstorm why there's so much flooding that goes on in the Charlotte area. And the reason is, is that we don't have any open space left in Charlotte. If it weren't for Mecklenburg County Park and Rec, there would be no open space in Charlotte, absolutely none. And all of this is now drifting into Union County. All of this is drifting into Gaston County, into Iredell County, into Cabarrus County, and uh, to Anson County. And the problem is, is that our politicians don't realize that every time they approve a new development, they are having to ultimately ask us as the taxpayers to pay for that development because there's infrastructure that comes with roads, there's infrastructure that comes with school systems, there's infrastructure that comes with power and, and uh, telephone and cable, and then the roads. The cheapest part of building a road is building the road. The most expensive part is going to be to maintain that road forever. I think Charlotte is, is relatively a very young city, it's a very young region. And I think we are so caught up in the opportunity to make money today that we are not considering what the next generation is going to have to deal with. The Catawba Lands Conservancy's role is to preserve uh, open space and to preserve what's important uh, in, in open space and also the, our drinking water. Uh, Mountain Island Lake is where the Charlotte, Charlotte and Gastonia gets its drinking water. And if we don't preserve that lake and the areas around it, then we are basically going to be polluting our own drinking water. And the Catawba River is getting dirtier every day because of development. So I say all that to say that there's a greater story than just Brooklynwood. I think the greater story is that, that we have preserved this forever for the next generation and the next 30 generations, the next 100 generations of, of the Charlotte region who will be coming out and enjoying hopefully the Queen's Cup as we, uh, we're, you know, this coming year we're going to celebrate our ninth anniversary. But, uh, uh, you know, I've, I'd like to be able to look down from heaven 100 years from now as we celebrate our 109th anniversary. And, and I think that's possible because Maryland Hunt Cup is enjoying its 105th anniversary. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity here, and that's why we put Brooklyn Wood into uh, a conservation easement. The gates open up at 10 o'clock. Uh, most of the tickets are pre-sold. So uh, the, the, the reason for that is that we have reserved parking scattered all around the race course. The only way that you can get a reserved parking space is you have to buy it in advance. And that's what tailgating is all about, the, the ability to be able to come to your parking space. Uh, we've had a lot of firsts in this race course. Uh, one is we, we, uh, uh, we build a first-class race facility, but we also are the first to sell personal space licenses, very similar to personal seat licenses that Jerry Richardson did. Got my idea from him. And uh, we've sold uh, almost a couple hundred of these personal space licenses where people can literally come and they can sit in the same spot that they can sit, you know, for the next 30 generations. They can just keep passing along to their next, uh, uh, to their children and grandchildren. But once the day gets going, it's really chock full of a lot of activity. From about 10 o'clock on, the Jack Russell Terrier races get going. And that happens in the uh, infield, not very far from where people park. It's a wonderful, funny thing if you've, if you've ever watched Frasier, where they have the little Jack Russell. Imagine five or six Jack Russells or more that are all chasing a fake bunny uh, over obstacles to get through a little hole that's, uh, that they have to go through. And whoever wins that, they win a heat. And then they progress on. Uh, Jack Russells naturally do this. This is what they do. They're very aggressive little animals. Uh, they're kindly aggressive. I mean, they typically don't go around biting people, but they um, they are full of personality. So the Carolina Jack Russell Terrier Club is responsible for putting that on. So we we give them a portion of the infield to set up their little terrier track. While all that's going on people then begin to set up their tailgates. And there's an opportunity for people to actually um, enter into the tailgate contest. And that thing's getting big every year. Every year it's growing and growing and growing and growing. And people, we have uh, most, uh, most original design, most whimsical, and most creative. And then we give awards out for, um, uh, for the uh, tailgate contest. Then we've got the hat contest, men's, women's, and children. 
and that's becoming a big deal. I think last year we had over 200 entries, which I think we're going to have to cut off. It's just getting too big. It's taking it's now it takes almost an hour just to get through that contest. It's it's tremendous. And while all that's going on, um, people are continuing to tailgate and have fun and sort of yuck it up. And we usually have the Mecklenburg Hounds. It's a fox hunting group here in uh, in the Charlotte region, and they will come out and and uh, they'll do a, what we call a hound walk. Uh, so there'll be an opportunity to watch uh, huntsmen on their horses with a pack of hounds walk around the race course, and that's a sight all into itself. We usually have a bagpipe band, and uh, they'll make it about halfway around the race course uh, in their uh, kilts and things like that. But we also have Brooklynwood Village, where there's a lot of things that people can do. They can get T-shirts, uh, uh, sign up for raffle tickets. Uh, there's all kinds of activities. Carolina Raptor Center is pleased to be here today to release a red-tailed hawk. This particular bird is being held by one of our volunteers, Amy, is with Carolina Raptor Center due to a gunshot wound. We're able to rehab a lot of birds. Uh, in past years, we've taken in as many as 700 injured raptors. Our goal is to release those birds back in the wild to beautiful places like this and also to teach the public about the importance of raptors as indicators of the health of our environment. We have an exhibit down here. I hope you'll come and see us and talk to us. And we're going to see about releasing this bird. It is one of the wonderful things that's happening today at Brooklynwood in this steeplechase races. We have a jockey walk where you have an opportunity to walk around with a jockey and you get to hear from his perspective what it's like to ride a horse at 30 miles per hour over a fence. And uh, we tried it out, actually courtesy of another uh, race meet over in Southern Pines, Stony Brook. And uh, they tried it one year to great success and it was interesting. We started here at the finish line. And there were, you know, we kept making announcements, and there were about 15 or 20 people that showed up. So the jockey, Toby Edwards, went around walking around the race course. And as time went on, it was a little bit like the Pied Piper. All of a sudden, more and more people started getting in. By the time he made it up here, there were over 150 people that were following him. And uh, last year, we ended up having to get two jockeys because the crowds were getting too big. He couldn't talk and be able to answer everybody's question. We really want the crowd to really sort of understand what the sport is about because it's just, it, it's not only an engaging sport, it's a lovely sport and it, it is poetry, but we also wanted to educate them that there's more to this thing than just uh, a bunch of thin guys getting on fast horses and going around. I mean, it's a very serious sport. So when all that's going on, uh, the horses are in the stable area getting ready to do their thing. And the grooms and the uh, and the horsemen are preparing their horses for the first race, and the horses will come to the parade ring, which is right here next to the finish line. And you'll notice we put the parade ring right in the infield because we really wanted to again engage the public. And I think people are just amazed when they see these beautiful animals walking around. It's just it's very colorful. It's it's hard to explain. At around uh, 1.20, the, uh, the, you hear the call to the post, the traditional And then um, the, the jockeys are thrown up on their horses, and then they gallop out to the, uh, to the start, wherever that start happens to be, and then they line up. And that's the beginning of what is anywhere from five to seven races on the card. They run about every 30 minutes or so. Uh, the races are all different, uh, different horses, uh, usually same jockeys, but different horses, uh, different uh, distances, different conditions, uh, different purse money. Sometimes they run over the brush fences, sometimes they run over the timber fences. Some are amateurs, most are professional. We'll have a couple flat races, a couple ones for fat guys like me to ride in a race. Uh, we call it the high weight flat race, training flat. First of all, this is Ron Altman, who's the executive director of the Catawba Lands Conservancy, and all of you race fans have been uh, responsible for what I'm about to give Ron, and also the sponsors and the advertising. And uh, I'm going to hand it to you. Before I give you a check, I'm going to let you give a 30-second spiel. 
on what the conservancy means to the Charlotte region. But you only get 30 seconds. That's already the argument. Thanks, Bill. Well, the Conservancy is a land trust, and what we do is acquire and protect land in the Charlotte region. We're coming up on about 5,000 acres, thanks to the support of many of you, and uh, we hope to continue to do that into the future. Thanks. Very good. And most of you know this Brooklyn Wood that you're sitting on right now has been put into a permanent conservation easement. So the way you see it today is exactly the way it will be for the next million years. So I want to thank you all. And Ron, the most important moment of the day is I'm going to hand you a check for $30,000. Congratulations. And then, if that's not enough, at the end of the day, if you don't think you've had enough partying to go on, we have we call it the uh, the uh, Michelob Light Hot Walk Party. And there we have a live band in the clubhouse that would be normally behind me. And for two hours, we offer free food, free entry, a live band. The only thing you pay for is beer and wine. Cokes, Cokes are free. The reason it's called Hot Walk is uh, right after a horse runs a race, he is hot walked because you're trying to get him to cool down. Sort of the opposite of what you'd, you'd think it would be cool walk, but it's actually a hot walk. And uh, so I adopted the name the Hot Walk Party. Um, so we're, this is the cool down for the, the spectators. If they haven't had enough partying, we're going to get them cranked up again. <laughs> it's just to go here. And we usually get anywhere from 800 to 1,000 people underneath a tent. And, uh, you know, again, one of the beauties of our racing is it runs rain or shine. So uh, fortunately, we've never had a total rain out. La last year, um, we had rain in the morning. Uh, so it made it just enough to be muddy and interesting and all that. But it was a beautiful, it turned out to be a day like this, a little on the warmer side. And it, it was just a spectacular day. And I think that's the beauty. What I remember of steeplechase racing as a kid is I remember that it was a very fun family event. I remember that every year was something unique. Something always different happened, whether it was rain. I remember going to the Maryland Hunt Cup and we had a streaker. Now that's sort of dating myself, but that's the 70s, right? We had a streaker run right down the middle of the race course, <laughs> buck naked. Finally, the cops uh, wrestled him to the ground and put a blanket around him, somebody's tailgate blanket probably, <laughs> and then they escorted him off. You know, I've been there rain. I've been there. I've been there when it's snowing, and. Um, every year is just something different. It, it is as uh, one of our former executive directors, Laura Edwards, used to say, say, she said, you know, what's unique about a steeplechase race is it takes on a life of its own, and it really does. I have to conclude with the story about Break Clean, because I, <laughs> uh, a very sad thing happened in February when we had the, uh, the, the ice storm. And um, I had both Jay William, who's my horse that I ride now, and uh, Bray Clean were out in the field. And most of the ice storms that we get are, uh, they, they affect the roads, but they very rarely really affect the ground, per se. <clears throat> and um, I considered bringing them into the stalls that evening and decided, you know, horses are outdoor creatures. They, don't want, they really don't like being cooped up in a stall, and I decided to keep them out in the stall. So I had Jay William, my horse, in training as a, as a flat horse, and I came out at around uh, 6.30 that morning to feed him, and I saw Bray Clean up here in the upper part of the pasture, and he was wagging his head like that, um, and he was holding his leg up like that. And I immediately said, oh my God, and that is never a good sign. And as I, uh, I jumped out of my car and I kept saying to myself, oh God, please, please don't let this what I think it is. And uh, as I got up to him, I cried because I realized he had broken his shoulder and uh, we had to put him down. It was awful. It was just terrible. But the Queen's Cup is really, it's a public entity. This, this is for the public, first and foremost. So the public owns this. Uh, yeah, they don't own the land, but the public owns the venue and they own the entity. And the public will ultimately decide the success and the future of the Queen's Cup. 
So all I would ask is if, for those that have not experienced the event, give it a shot because there's an old line. For those that have experienced it, they understand it. For those that have never experienced it, there's no words that can explain a day at the steeplechase races. So all I would say is give it a chance, just like you've given everything else a chance. Give this an opportunity to, to explore a day out in the country with your family and friends um, steeped in history and watch sport as sport was originally presented several hundred years ago. And I think you will walk away amazed and surprised, as I first did. And I think, as we often say, steeplechase racing, unlike any other sport, assaults all of your senses. And I really believe that's true. Not only your, your hearing, but your smells and your, the visual. And if you ever stood next to a fence with 15 horses going over it at 30 miles per hour, truly the hair on the back of your neck will stand up. Even the most jaded will be impressed with it. So give us a chance. Experience the thrill of the chase.